Thank you so very much. Um, I think there was somebody, I'm not sure, wanted me to pray in Hebrew, and I'm happy to do that. I'll pray in Hebrew if somebody will pray in Afrikaans. Eloheinu Moshe, Enu, Anakta Madim Rahab, Bishwil Kore Brochot, Shonakta Kebanim Mimha, Ana Adonai, Behazdecha, Tishpoch Lechachecha Aleinu, Vetiftak et enayim shelanu letaferat shel vrecha, Veten lanu Abba, Hachokmah vehemeretz, Lo rak bishmoha, Ava gam ken la asot la, Lefi ma shekatu bedvrecha, Beshem Yeshua HaMashiach, Adonainu, Goleinu vetzidkateinu, Heavenly Father, we ask you to pour your spirit upon us now, opening our eyes to the glory and the meaning of your word. More than this, Father, give us the wisdom and courage to be not only hearers of your word, but doers also. We ask these things believing in the name of your Son, the Messiah, Jesus, who is our Savior and our righteousness. In his name we pray. Amen. Good enough for King David. It's good enough for me. Well, you know, the Gospel of St. John is the most festal of the Gospels. What I mean by the most festal is, when John was inspired to write by the Holy Spirit, he was always trying to explain how Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament feasts of Israel how they pointed to him in different aspects. Now that's also true in the Synoptic Gospels, but it's especially a feature of John's Gospel, especially John's. One of the Jewish feasts that was not actually found in the book of Leviticus, but that was predicted in the book of Daniel, is the Jewish feast of Hanukkah that takes place around Christmas time, the 25th of the Hebrew month of Kislev, roughly corresponding to December. Now, I'm not going to talk about all that now. It's the wrong time of year. But if you will, just for a moment, turn with me, please, to the Gospel of St. John, chapter 10. I'm sorry, the Gospel of St. John, chapter 9. And he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him in verse 38. That's one of those verses that Jehovah's Witnesses don't like. Jesus is worshipped ten times in the New Testament. The Greek word is proskuto, and if he wasn't God, why did he receive the worship? And he worshipped him. Now, the Jehovah's Witnesses Bible mistranslate that to something that the Greek does not say. The Greek does say it worshipped him. He worshipped him. And Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, so that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. He came that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. What is he talking about? Well, Hanukkah, this is Hanukkah now. It's called the Feast of Dedication in English. I'm not sure in Afrikaans or Dutch. In English, it's called the Feast of Dedication, but in Hebrew, it's Hanukkah. The Feast of Hanukkah is the Jewish Feast of Miracles and the Jewish Feast of Lights. And it's against this background that Jesus says, I am the light of the world. He comes to fulfill the meaning of Hanukkah light that you may see. Well, this poor young guy who was born blind, Jesus opened his eyes. Now we have to understand something about the healing miracles of Jesus. The healing miracles of Jesus always had three meanings. The first meaning, obviously, was the compassion of God. Jesus did them out of compassion. That's the first reason. But remember, he only did what he saw his father doing. In the pool of Bethesda, for instance, he only healed one person, the one his father told him. 
Be careful of people who go around saying, Jesus healed everybody, so we should go around healing everybody. That was not true. He didn't. He only did what he saw his father doing. In Luke chapter 5, verse 17, it says, The dunamis, the power of the Lord, was there for him to perform healing. Although he was God and could have used his own divine power, he did not. He would never act out of concert with his father. His father had to be empowering him to do it. Somebody cannot just arbitrarily go around praying for the sick and commanding a disease to disappear. You can pray for the sick anytime, but if you're going to command a disease to disappear in the name of Jesus, that same dunamis, that same power that was there for Jesus, in Luke 5, 17, has to be there for you. In other words, the Holy Spirit must be telling you to do it at that time. To command somebody to get out of a deathbed or a cancer to disappear or get out of a wheelchair, the Holy Spirit has to be telling you or it's not going to happen. Now today you have ignorant people and sometimes con artists who are going around, I command you to get up in the name of Jesus, hallelujah. And of course, if you don't get up, it's because you don't have any faith. Then they begin putting the sick people and the elderly people under condemnation. These people are at best ignorant. They're always dangerous, and sometimes they're just connivers. That's not how healing works. That's not how any gift of the Spirit works. You can't go around prophesying. Most of what's called prophecy today are not, are not real prophecies. It's what Jeremiah called the futility and deception of their own mind. So much of what's called prophecy today is simply, is simply clairvoyance. It's more like the occult than it is what the scripture means by prophecy. The Holy Spirit has to come on you at that time and give you that prophecy. You can't go around. Most tongues today Unless the Holy Spirit comes on you and gives you that tongue in a situation, it's just gibberish. Now, I don't deny there's a biblical gift of tongues or a biblical gift of healing or a biblical gift of prophecy. I don't believe these things ended with the apostles. But I do believe, I'm sure, so much of what we see today is not real. This is not to get rid of or dismiss what is real. But it is to get dismissing get rid of what is not real so that what is real can be brought forward. Okay. He heals this kid. Now that's the first reason the Lord did miracles, the compassion of God. And the Father empowered him. Okay. The second reason he did miracles was that certain miracles the Jews considered at that time in the second temple period to be messianic miracles. They believed that there were miracles that only the Messiah could do. Because Elijah raised somebody from the dead, they didn't believe that raising somebody from the dead was a messianic miracle. But they did believe what we would in modern medical terms, scientific terms called neural regeneration, somebody with a dead optic nerve or a dead audio nerve, they believed only the Messiah could make a blind person see or a deaf person hear. Nobody ever did that. So the second reason he did these miracles were that they were emblematic of his Messiahship. They were emblematic of his Messiahship. They're one of the five reasons that Jesus gives for people believing in him in John chapter 5. Now notice he gives five reasons in John 5. Not miracles themselves, but only miracles in concert with other things. The first being the witness of Moses and the scriptures. Jesus did miracles here at Hanukkah, and it says in John 10, the next chapter, he asked them, for which one of these miracles works do you stone me? People don't come to faith or believe because of seeing miracles. Jesus warned, a wicked and unadulterous generation seeks a sign. 
When you see people flocking to stadiums to see money preachers do this, that is a wicked and an adulterous generation seeking a sign. In the scripture, these signs follow. Did Jesus have miracles? Yes, but he never had a miracle crusade. Did Jesus have healings? Yes, but he never had a healing crusade. He had a repentance crusade. He never allowed signs and wonders, what we call in Hebrew, nesim v'niflaot. And remember, Hanukkah is the Jewish feast of, of miracles. He never allowed these things to be the focus of his message or his ministry. When Jesus healed people, he would usually say, it's between us, keep it to yourself. Don't tell anybody. Repent and sin no more, that's the thing, but the, the miracle, that's, that's, I got you covered, that's between us. Not like you see today with the con artists. But then there's the third reason, and that's the one we're going to look at now. His healing miracles illustrate salvation in some way. For instance, again at the pool of Bethesda in John chapter 5, Jesus heals this paralytic who was confined to a wooden pallet. And when he heals him, he tells him, pick up your pallet. and sin no more. Now, Hebrew is different than Western languages. It's different than English and Afrikaans. In Hebrew, a tree is called etz, etz. But anything made from a tree is called etz. A pencil is called etz in Hebrew. This table is made out of etz, anything made from a tree, wood is called etz. It says in the Torah, cursed is everyone who hangs on an etz. When Jesus took our sin to give us his righteousness, he died a curse of God in our place, hanging on an etz. Okay. So why did Jesus tell this paralytic, pick up your pallet? He doesn't need the pallet anymore. He can walk. If God healed somebody from polio, would he say, get back in your wheelchair? If the Lord was to heal my lymphatic edema, would he say, pick up your crutches? Why does Jesus tell this guy to pick up the pallet? Because it was AIDS. In figure, Jesus was saying, pick up your cross and sin no more. You understand? He was telling him to live a crucified life. Whatever happened to that guy, sin caused his illness. Now, sin does not cause all illness. That is another myth, sometimes lie. They asked Jesus here at Hanukkah, who sinned, this boy or his parents? There were certain kinds of illnesses that the Jews thought meant you were cursed of God. One was infertility, okay? But another was being blind because you couldn't read the Torah, the scripture. And if you couldn't read the Torah, the scripture, it meant you couldn't worship in the temple or the synagogue. In the ancient world and other civilizations, literacy was only for royalty, the aristocracy, military commanders, pagan priesthood, the elite of the societies. But among the Hebrews, the Levites had to make sure every Jew could read the word of God. <laughs> every Jew had to be literate. And every Jew had to be numerate to practice their faith. To this day, education is highly emphasized in the Jewish community. And it goes back in part to the scriptures. <coughs> okay. 
So it was seen as a curse if you were blind. But Jesus said he didn't sin or his parents, but rather that God would be glorified. Yet, in James chapter 5 and in Psalm 32 and in John chapter 5, we do see that sin can cause specific illnesses. Now, of course, in the broad sense, what a theologian would call the homotosphere, all illness and death itself is the result of the sin of Adam, in that broad sense. But we cannot say that every illness is the result of a specific sin. It may be or it may not be. In this case of John 9, it was not. In the case of John 5, it was. Well... Sin no more. Pick up your pallet and sin no more. Pick up your cross and live a crucified life. Don't live immorally anymore. It may have been, and to this day, and here in Africa and in certain places in the Middle East, you have certain forms of dystrophy and paralysis that are STDs, that are sexually communicated diseases that cause paralysis. That may have been it, but nobody can be sure. Okay? Certain illnesses were seen as curses from God. What we call in Hebrew, Lod Tahor, Lod Tahor, ritual uncleanness, okay? I won't go into all the reasoning and back of it too much, but where the woman had the continual vaginal bleeding and she touched Jesus, the hem of his garment, remember? And she stopped bleeding after 12 years, having suffered the pain of many physicians. Now, when it says pain, it meant pain. In those days, there was no cauterization, no anticoagulants. <laughs> they actually tried to seal capillaries with hot irons. Can you imagine that as an internal medical procedure, a surgical procedure? It's unspeakable. It means torture. Unbelievable. And this poor woman's 12 years with this, but there's something else. Because she was low to whore, because she was ritually unclean from the bleeding, she was socially ostracized. <laughs> Anybody she touched would have also been unclean. They would have had to go through this whole ritual of purification that took a month and all this stuff. <laughs> right? A week to a month, it does a whole ordeal. Now, this whole thing of, 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 of menstrual blood was a big thing. I'll explain it very briefly. You know the verse in Isaiah, all of our righteousness is as filthy rags. You know that verse. Or as a polluted garment, I don't know how it is in Afrikaans. In those days, of course, there were no feminine hygiene products. They simply had rags. So, the idea was this. If you look at a young couple who's battling infertility, a young married couple trying to have a baby, the last thing they want to see is a menstrual period because that's a failed birth. <laughs> they're waiting, they're hoping, they do the IVF, the implantation, they're waiting, hoping, just hoping it doesn't come. <laughs> because if it does, it means it's a failed birth. All of our righteous deeds are as filthy rags. Trying to be saved by our own works is a failed second birth. You understand? <laughs> Trying to be saved by our own righteousness, our own works, is a failed second birth. There's a whole spiritual meaning and typology to the, the reason the woman was ritually unclean with the blood. I'm just touching on it a bit. Well, he heals her. But when she touched him, now he was defiled. You understand? He took our diseases. He bore our infirmities. He became defiled on her behalf. That's why she was healed. All of these miracles illustrate salvation. We are all blind until we see Jesus, until we see the light. 
A baby is born blind, isn't it? And it sees. Unsaved people are spiritually blind until they see the light. We are all lame until we pick up a cross and follow Jesus. We cannot walk in the Spirit. Okay. We're all lame. We're all blind. We're all defiled. We're all deaf until his sheep hear his voice. When you got saved, you didn't just hear the voice of the evangelist or the preacher or the person who witnessed to you. You could hear a human voice all day long and how to be the Holy Spirit quickening you to hear the voice of Jesus. It's just like the resurrection of Lazarus. Jesus said, roll away the stone. Lazarus, come forth. You unbind him. When we evangelize, preach the gospel, witness, give our testimony, we're only rolling away the stone. We're making it possible for the unsaved, those who are spiritually dead, to hear the voice of Christ. But then Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth. Only the Son of Man can call the dead to life. Only Jesus can save. They have to hear his voice. Then when he comes out of the tomb, Jesus says, you unbind him. That's discipleship. People all have baggage from the old nature and the old creation. When they come to faith, then the church comes into play, discipling young believers and things like this. It always illustrates salvation. So when you see a healing miracle, it's something to do with salvation. It illustrates salvation in some way. The lame walk, the deaf hear, the blind see. The defiled become clean. Always to do with salvation in some way. Those are the three reasons Jesus did miracles. Well, let's understand this now. I came that those who are blind will see but those who see will become blind. The religious establishment of the Sanhedrin at that time was dominated by the Sadducees. There were also others, Pharisees, Herodians. There were cult groups like the Essenes. There were different ones. They differed from each other in what they believed, much the same as denominations or sects in the church do. This sect, that sect. I only mention that in passing, but it's very interesting to understand what the Pharisees believed, what the Sadducees believed, what the Herodians believed, what the Essenes believed, what the Samaritans believed. It's very much like the spectrum of belief within Christendom, <laughs> in any event. The religious establishment knew the scriptures, at least intellectually. They were supposed to teach the people the word of God, but they didn't. They used their theological education and social privilege to create a power base for themselves, to give themselves a social status, and a financial position beneficial to themselves. <laughs> they looked down on the ordinary people. The ordinary people were called the Am Ha'aretz, the Am Ha'aretz, the people of the land. And Probably the primary reason that the Sanhedrin hated Jesus was he was interpreting the word of God for the ordinary people. Knowledge is power. And he was empowering ordinary people, farmers and people like this, tradesmen, fishermen. The religious establishment didn't like this. It began when he was bar mitzvah age, when he was 12, 13. 
and founding the wise men in the temple. You remember the parable from Isaiah, the parable of the vineyard. It says the Pharisees knew he spoke the parable about them. They understood it. But the apostles came to him privately and asked him what it meant. He was telling ordinary people the correct interpretation of the word of God that the religious establishment was using to keep themselves in, misusing to keep themselves in power and in pocket. Their attitude was, who are you to question us? These people are accursed. They don't know the Torah. We do. So Jesus says to them, yeah, you see, you know the parables about you. Just think, when Jesus was born, Herod and all Jerusalem were afraid. So he asked the Levitical priests from the Sanhedrin where the Messiah was to be born. And they said, Bethlehem. They actually knew what was in the scripture. They knew it intellectually. The Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. They knew what they told Herod. Well, that was quite a situation. Jesus tells them, <coughs> you see, but because you see, you're responsible. Where much is given, much is respected, expected. You see. If you didn't see, you wouldn't be so guilty. But because you know better, I'm going to strike you blind. I'm going to take these other people who were born blind and open their eyes to see. That's what he was saying. Then he goes on. I'm going to open the eyes of the pagans, of the Gentile nations. This would have shocked any Jew. That would have been like telling a dormant a hundred years ago. The Zulus are going to become Christians and you're going to become pagan. <laughs> In the Dutch deformed church. <laughs> well, quite a thing. The blind are going to see but those who see will be blind. This blindness of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin is illustrated in St. Paul. Remember when he was knocked off the horse, he was struck blind because he was persecuting Jews who believed. That is not when St. Paul was born again. If you read the book of Acts carefully, he had to act on what he heard Jesus say to him, and go to the street called Straight in, in Damascus, to the house of Ananias, and then when he acted on what Jesus told him, hands were laid on him, then he saw again, he regained his sight. He would later write in Corinthians that when the law is read, when the Torah is read, there's a veil in front of their eyes. To this day, with unsaved Jewish people, but especially the rabbis. They're blind. There's a veil on front of their face. Can you imagine a nation? They are the genetic and anthropological descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They had 2,000 years of biblical history before Jesus was born. The whole reason for their existence as a nation and a people for 2,000 years was to prepare for the Messiah to come, to be lights to the nations. Then when the Messiah comes, most of them can't recognize him. Their whole history, their whole heritage, 
They're blind. They're blind. Jesus said, those who see will be blind. God didn't give the Torah to the Bushmen in Africa. He didn't give the Torah to the Eskimos in Greenland. He didn't give the Torah to Europeans or Asians. He gave the Torah to the Jews. But you see, it's Africans, Asians, Europeans. They see the gospel. And many of them believe. Although it is changing, very few of his own people believe, although that will change. Prophetically, we're assured it will, and it's beginning to change already. Thank God. The natural branches are grafted in again in the last days. Nonetheless, the blind see. Your ancestors were blind. The Jews saw. <laughs> The priesthoods of the pagans, they were Sagormas. They were Druid priests in Ireland or something. They were medicine men. They were shamans. The Jews had the Levites. They saw. Those who saw became blind. Those who were blind see. So we have two kinds of blind people. Everybody's born blind. That's why they need to be born again. The same as a baby is biologically born blind. Everybody's born blind, so they must be born again. But there's two kinds of blind people. The ones who see and the ones who stay blind. <laughs> Simply stated, God makes a difference between those who are blind and those who are willfully blind. Let's talk about the world a little bit first. In my wayward youth, I was a radical socialist, virtually a communist. There was a narrative, an official line but I came to realize there was a problem with socialism. It didn't work. For instance, Karl Marx said, now the people in A and C don't know this, but this, they claim to believe this, but they don't even know what it is, most of them. Karl Marx said that as capitalism evolved from feudalism, Communism would evolve from capitalism because he was a Darwinist. He believed in evolution. <laughs> That's what he believed. It would evolve. He believed in Hegelian philosophy, dialectics, the thesis, the antithesis, the synthesis. He was influenced by Hegel and by Darwin. Communism would evolve out of capitalism as capitalism evolved from feudalism. There was a problem. Marx said that communism would never work in Russia. It was too primitive. It was still feudal. But the Bolshevik Revolution, communism, did not begin in England, the first capitalist country <laughs> in Europe. It rather began in Russia, the last feudal country. Right from the outset, Marxism was flawed. It was proven not to work. It was doomed. The model was wrong. The thinking was wrong. Communism never should have happened in a feudal country. They didn't evolve enough yet. It should have happened only in England, he said, it would begin. That's why I lived in London, it didn't happen. 
Now, if you tell a communist that, when the Soviet Union was still standing, the old men in the Kremlin, it didn't matter. They stuck to the narrative, the party line. There's going to be a communist uprising of the proletariat in the capitalist world. But it never happened. It never happened. Communism has never worked anywhere. It didn't begin in the capitalist world. It only began in the feudal world. And it failed. It doesn't matter. We stick to the party line. They had a newspaper called Pravda that meant truth. Another one called it Zvestia. Truth was not the actual facts. Truth was the party line, the political decision. <laughs> truth, the definition of truth was whatever the party apparatus, the apartheid, the Russians called it, decided. I recall in South Africa, we have a ministry over in the Cape where we take care of black children who are HIV, AIDS. And I recall a number of years ago, when we began the work, the following. This was before antiretrovirals were invented. Every microbiologist in the world said, everyone, AIDS was a retroviral infection. It was the AIDS virus. Every one of them said it was retroviral. The Pasteur Institute in Paris, John Hopkins or Harvard in America, Oxford in England, they all said it was a retrovirus. In this country, as a political decision, as a political decision, the ANC health minister said, it's a social disease. We don't need retrovirals. We have to give the people African potatoes. <laughs> this happened in your country. You've got to stick to the narrative. You'd think that anybody in their right mind would say, you're nuts. That's the health minister. No, you've got to stick to the party line and follow the official narrative. They're not blind. Woefully blind. Everyone in this room, chromosomally is double X if you're female, XY if you're male. That's it. An exceptionally rare phenomenon of super males who are double Y, but so few <laughs> statistically irrelevant. It doesn't matter if you surgically re-sculpture somebody to resemble a male or a female. The DNA in every cell in their body is either going to be double X or XY. There is not a geneticist in the world who will dispute this. It is a fact. Nobody can question that fact. Nobody. You remain chromosomally male or female just because you surgically redesign somebody. There's actually a woman whose picture is on the internet who had herself with cosmetic surgery re-sculpted to resemble a cat. I'm not kidding. She even looks like a cat. But she's not a cat. She's still a human. She's, well, actually, she might be a nut. <laughs> now, nobody can deny this. None of these politicians or judges or homosexual activists or lesbian activists, none of them can deny this. They're not blind. They are willfully blind. It says three times in Romans chapter 1, 
concerning homosexuals and lesbians, the Lord will give them over to believe it's natural. You want to be blind? I'll make you blind. The Lord sends a spirit of error to make them believe a lie. Ultimately, we're told concerning the Antichrist, those who do not love the truth, the Lord will send a deluding influence to make them believe the lie. Same as he put the lying spirit in the mouth of King Ahab's prophets, remember, in the days of Micaiah? You want to believe a lie? I'll make you believe a lie. You want to be blind even though you see you're choosing to be willfully blind? I'll make you blind. You won't be able to see. Look what I did to Israel. I'll make you blind. Transsexuals, those who've had sex change surgery, so-called, but it's not real. They got this whole thing of transgender. Now, you understand something. In English, I'm not sure in Afrikaans, but in English, the term gender was a grammatical term, not a biological term. But in certain languages, like Greek and Latin, where Western languages come from, you can have a neuter gender and you can have things that are masculine that take the feminine or feminine that take the masculine. Like, for instance, in Greek, the term rock, in the masculine, it is Petros, Peter. But Jesus is called the Petra, the feminine form in Corinthians. Gender in Greek does not have, masculine and feminine does not have to do with sex, you understand? Well, I, I can speak Spanish. Map. Mapa is map. But the article, you don't say la mapa, the feminine, you, you use the male article, el mapa. Gender, male, masculine, feminine is not to do with biological sex, it's to do with grammar. Somebody came along in the 1970s and took a grammatical term and pretended it was a biological term. <laughs> so you have transgender. Now nobody can deny this. But that doesn't matter. They're not just blind. They are willfully blind. Now don't get me wrong. When I was a teenager, I was a cocaine addict. My sin would have put me in the same hell as their sin. I was no better than they were, just that my sin was different. But I was on my way to the same hell if Jesus didn't save me. Praise God he did, but let's look. You can go to any university in the world with a science faculty. And you can go to the Faculty of Information Science, Computer Science. When Charles Darwin was alive, there was no such thing as information science. It existed embryonically in the 1940s. It was really born in the 1950s. There was no such thing as information science in the days of Charles Darwin in the early 19th century. You go into any faculty of information science, computer science in the world, and they will tell you there is no such thing as auto-encryption. You see a software program, you see any kind of coded information. There had to be a pre-existing intelligence to write it. Even though there are software programs that can write other software programs, somebody still had to write the master program. There had to be a pre-existing intelligence. Information cannot come from a vacuum, particularly complicated information. If you had a supercomputer like a Cray 2 computer or something, running on, say, 100,000 lines of programming, zeros and ones, right? That would be considered a massive, massively large software program. But that's only zeros and ones. 
The human genome alone has four nucleotides. in the sequencing. Forget about 100,000 lines of information. The human genome alone has 13 billion, which must be able to produce an organism that can interact with the biosphere and with other species that have their own genomes. We're not talking about the zebra genome, okay, or the puff adder genome. <laughs> or the palm tree genome, just the human one. So any professor of information science will tell you encrypted information requires an existing intelligence to produce it. I'm not joking. Walk out the door across the campus to the faculty of biomedical sciences. There a professor of biology will tell you there is encrypted information that came from nothing. <laughs> They're not blind. They're willfully blind. No place in the natural environment does recombinant DNA transmutate across the genus barrier from one species to another, except in things like bacteriophages, where it destroys the host cell. It doesn't cause it to evolve. It just doesn't add up. And they know it. The second law of thermodynamics, bioentropy. Can you show me the exception? One exception. I can't. The only way to circumvent entropy, second law of thermodynamics, is with a biological system. But a biological system requires a genome. <laughs> it just doesn't work. As it says in Corinthians, professing to be wise, they became fools. And a blind, they're willfully blind. In the United States, the suicide rate has reached a shocking 3% among heterosexuals, among so-called transsexuals, it is 41%. You point this out, Bruce Jenner, whatever his name is now, oh, you're a homophobe. No, you're a nut. There is not a physician in the world that does not know that human intestinal tissue is a single strata of columbar epithelium. Rips very easily not designed to facilitate sexual penetration. Hence, the infectious disease rate and certain kind of cancers like Carposi sarcoma are astronomically higher among homosexuals. Oh, you're just a homo. <laughs> <coughs> you're expected to believe the lie. And if you refuse to believe an obvious lie, you're the freak. Just like in the Soviet Union. Pravda, izvestia, tavarish, da. It goes on and on like this. 
just one thing after another. They're not blind. They're woefully blind. You can prove it. You can statistically demonstrate it. It doesn't matter. We're sticking to the narrative. I asked the question. There are 57 Islamic countries in the world. 57. Can you please show me one that will give Christians and Jews the rights that Muslims have in South Africa or Great Britain or anywhere in Europe or America or Canada or Australia or New Zealand. Can you show me one? Oh, you're just an Islamophobe. Well, what about the 300,000 dead Christians in East Timor? Oh, that's nothing to do with Islam. You're just an Islamophobe. What about the 90 to 100,000 dead Christians in the southern Philippines? Oh, that's nothing to do with Islam. You're just an Islamophobe. What about the upwards of 1 million dead Christians in northern Nigeria? Oh, that's nothing to do with Islam. You're just an Islamophobe. What about the 3.2 million dead Christians wanted in Sudan? Oh, that's nothing to do with Islam. You're just an Islamophobe. Well, what about the attacks on the hotels and the hospitals in Mumbai, India? Oh, that's nothing to do with Islam. You're just an Islamophobe. What about the theater bombings in Moscow? What about shooting the four-year-old kids in the back? In Chechnya, oh, that's nothing to do with Islam. You're just an Islamophobe. What about September 11th in New York? Oh, you, you're just an Islamophobe. That's nothing to do with Islam. You're just an Islamophobe. What about the London tube and bus bombings? Oh, that's nothing to do with Islam. You're just an Islamophobe. What about the Charlie Heber attacks in Paris? Oh, that's nothing to do with Islam. You're just an Islamophobe. Oh, what about the Islamic riots in Sydney, Australia? Oh, that's nothing to do with Islam. You're just an Islamophobe. What about the Bandler riots in Paris? Oh, that's nothing to do with Islam. You're just an Islamophobe. What about the Bradford riots in England? Oh, that's nothing to do with Islam. You're just an Islamophobe. Oh, I see. Well, who's doing it? The Quakers? <laughs> They're not blind. They're willfully blind. There's nobody more blind than religious people. Nobody. I always remember the debate I had with an Orthodox rabbi in New York. Daniel 9, Hamashiach keeps the decrov over the moot if Neha Horban should have better me dash Hashemit. The Messiah had to come and die before the second temple would be destroyed. I even showed him from the Talmud, from what other rabbis said, that that's about the Messiah. I told him in English and in Hebrew. Finally, he said, give me a better source than the book of Daniel. <laughs> I said, you just told me you believed Daniel was a Hebrew prophet. He spoke for God. You want a better source than God? If there's a better source than God, he wouldn't be God. He wasn't blind, he's willfully blind. And ask a Roman Catholic. Jesus warned if anybody says I've come back physically, other than the way I left, don't believe it. But every time there's a mass, they say the bread and wine is transubstantiated. Jesus has returned physically. They call it the blessed sacrament. They kneel down, worship it, and pray to it. How can this be? You believe it's his real blood? Well, how come in Acts 15, the apostles said, don't drink blood? Oh, you're just a bigot against Catholics. No, I'm not asking a question. Does the blood of Christ cleanse from all sin, or are you going to atone in purgatory for your own? Oh, you're just a bigot against Catholics. No, I'm not. You shall not make a graven image of anything 
and heaven above or earth beneath. You shall not bow down to them. What are you doing with those? Oh, you're just a bigot. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. You asked the wrong question. You offended me. They're not blind. They're willfully blind. It says in the Hadith that Muhammad married Aisha, the daughter of Abu Bakr, when she was six years old. He took her virginity at the age of nine. Islam's own religion teaches Muhammad was a pedophile. How dare you blaspheme the prophet? I'm only reading your own book. And they're blind. They're willfully blind. <laughs> we can go on and on and on. I was in Mumbai, India one time. We're opening an orphanage in India next month, but I was in Mumbai, India, Bombay. Huge city with millions and millions of people. Johannesburg is, is, is like small compared to it. Millions and millions of people. And I saw a, a little baby guy, maybe 18 months old or so, maybe two at the most, severely malnourished, laying on a mound of stinking garbage in the street. And thousands and thousands and thousands of people an hour were passing him by and thought nothing of it. Right up the road, right up the road, I saw it with my own eyes. They were feeding cows sacks of wheat. I would say, shoot the cow, give the kid a steak. <laughs> the life of the cow was worth more than the life of the baby. I saw it. And then I see people in the Western world, doing yoga and going to ashrams and following gurus. Look what that religion did for India. Oh, you're just a bigot. You don't believe in Darwinism, you're unscientific. Don't you know that chimpanzees have 98% of the same DNA as humans? Yes, and don't you know that bananas have 30%? But don't worry, sir, you're not a banana. You're a nut. <laughs> they're not blind. They're willfully blind. Doesn't matter. Blind. Communists, Muslims. Roman Catholics, homosexuals, the blind. But that's the world. The God of this world has blinded them. Such were we before Jesus opened our eyes. He came that the blind may see. That's the world. That's the way we were before we got saved by God's grace. Unless you had the advantage of getting saved as a kid. Growing up in a Christian family, which I did not. That's the world. No, that's not my problem. Crazy as it is, desperate as it is, frustrating as it is, I expect it from non believers. What bothers me is when it happens in what is supposed to be the body of Christ. We are told twice in the New Testament, the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. Ikrete in Greek. If the Holy Spirit is in control of someone, they're in control of themselves. 
if they're not in control of themselves, the Holy Spirit's not in control of them. If an alcoholic becomes a Christian and they backslide and go back to the world and begin getting drunk again, or going down to the Shabin for a jug of Vitblitz, are they in control of themselves? No. Therefore, the Holy Spirit's not in control of them, or they wouldn't be getting drunk again. If someone is not in control of themselves, the Holy Spirit's not in control of them. Ikrete, the fruit of the Spirit is self-control, we're told twice in the New Testament. I saw people at counterfeit revivals in Toronto, Canada, and Pensacola, Florida. This is just what they were doing. I know it was God, I couldn't control it. by virtue of the fact that you couldn't control it, proves prima facie it couldn't possibly be God. Did any revival come from that stupid, ridiculous garbage? No. But now those same people are following Bill Johnson and the new apostolic reformation, it doesn't matter. They're not blind. They're willfully blind. Willfully blind. That's frightening. When it's the world, it's one thing. When it's the church, it's another. The Son of Man had no place to lay his head. The servant is not above his master. Ask anything in my name, hallelujah, you will receive it. Just believe God for that Mercedes Benz. Believe God for that Bentley, hallelujah. Just ask Ray McCauley or Theo Vermorand. Hallelujah. If we ask according to his will, says in James, uh, John. If we ask with wrong motives, we won't get it, it says in James. That's negative. I refuse to receive that negativity in the name of John. You're not blind. They're willfully blind. Willfully. If an angel of God comes with another gospel, don't believe it. They're accursed, anathema. Galatians. Even if it's an angel. Again, I ask Catholic people. Is the blood of Christ cleansed from all sin, or are you going to burn in purgatory for your own? Which gospel do you want to believe? One is true, one is false. No, we have to be ecumenical and just love. Where did Jesus ever compromise truth in the name of love? Look at the woman at the well. As soon as she began with her false beliefs, you have that mountain, we have this mountain. He said, lady, you don't know what you're talking about. Salvation comes from the Jews. They have the truth. The Syrophoenician woman, please heal my daughter. I can't give the children's bread to dogs. That wasn't a racist statement. What he was saying is, your religion is pagan. It's unfit for human consumption. It's dog food. False religion is for dogs, not for humans. Jesus always made people deal with the truth. Not because he didn't love them, <coughs> but because he loved them very much. <coughs> he never compromised truth in the name of love. Because of love, he told them the truth. He told them the truth in love, but look what it says in John. Oh, he prayed we would be one. Read the whole passage. He prefaced that prayer by saying, Father, sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. You can't have unity of the spirit with people who are in error and who believe false doctrine. Two cannot walk down the same road if they do not agree.
these people buying into this garbage, this ecumenical stuff? You get in bed with the Pope, he's in bed with the Dalai Lama. They're not blind. They are willfully blind. Oh, but I was blessed! No, you weren't. You were deceived. That's Mormonism. When you nail a Mormon down to the Book of Mormon being false and contradicting the scriptures, their brainwashed program into resorting to their so-called testimony. If you've ever heard them, I got a burner in my bosom and I testify to you the church of Latter-day Saints is true. We had a team of evangelizing Mormons in Utah once. That's their Mecca in America. And I had the Journal of Discourses of Brigham Young. There's Quakers living on the moon. You really believe there's Quakers on the moon? I got a burning in my bosom, and I testify to you, the Church of Latter-day Saints is true. Yeah, I got a burning in my bosom, and I testify to you, there's Quakers living on the moon. <laughs> They weren't blind, they're willfully blind. The Jehovah's Witnesses must have knocked on your door. Jesus is worshipped ten times in the New Testament. They automatically change the subject. The word Trinity is not in the Bible. It either is the word millennium, but you say you believe in it. Deal with the fact he's worshipped as God. The Holy Spirit is a force or a power. The force be with you. How can you blaspheme an it? How can you grieve an it, an innominate force or power? They're not blind. Jehovah's Witnesses are willfully blind. Although some of them, praise God, do get saved. Same as Mormons, same as Catholics. But that's the world. What about believers going to crazy churches, following money preachers, following the New Apostolic Reformation, following the ecumenical movements? How do you justify this? You show them the facts, you show them the scripture, they cannot deny it. But they stick to the narrative. They're not blind. They're willfully blind. Jesus came that the blind may see. Until now, you may be in one of these dodgy churches and think it's normal, think it's natural, think it's right. You're blind until now. But Jesus is offering you eyesight. When it's the world, it's one thing. When it's the church, it's another. Jesus said that he came that the blind may see. But he also said he came that those who see will become blind. If you see the truth and continue to willfully believe a lie, God will strike you blind in judgment. If you're blind, don't worry about it. You ask Jesus to open your eyes and he will do it. But if you see and you still believe a lie, not only are you blind, you are willfully blind. I can't answer this question for anyone but myself. But I can ask it. I can't answer it for anybody but myself. But I can ask it. 
Are you blind? Are you not saved? You can get saved tonight. Are you in error in a church teaching these errors? You might be blind, but you can see tonight. If you're blind, do you want to see? But if you see these things and you choose to remain in the lie, you're not blind. You're woefully blind. Jesus came that the blind may see and that those who see may become blind. God bless and thank you for listening. If you're here tonight and you're not born again, please don't walk out that door without talking to me or to the pastor. Thank you.